Hey guys, uh, today we are starting the lecture from uh, Suraj. Suraj is PG candidate at Stanford University, under advising by Professor Chelsea Finn and Silvio Solares. And prior to his PhD, Suraj completed his bachelor's in computer science at the California Institute of Technology and spent time uh, in Google Brain Robotics and Facebook AI research. Uh, Suraj, could you please start? Yep, great. Um, thanks. So, yeah, my name is Serge Nair. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about supervising robot learning with language and video from the web. So the long-term vision of, of my research and a lot of the research we do in our lab is towards this goal of having generalist robots that you can just drop into a home that they've never been in before and could do a wide range of useful tasks. Um, and certainly there's a lot of problems that need to be solved before we accomplish this goal from better hardware and sensing. Um, but I would argue that one of the more, most um, kind of important uh, problems we need to solve is we need our robots to be able to generalize, right? So we need them to be able to generalize across tasks. So for example, they should be able to make coffee, clean, cook, even if they haven't explicitly seen those tasks before. Uh, they should be able to generalize across objects. So if they've you know, have a notion of how to make coffee, they should be able to do it even if the mug is not exactly the one that they were trained with. Uh, and they should be able to generalize across uh, domains or environments. So, you know, if the robot uh, has been trained how to, how to you know, make an omelet, if you put it into a new kitchen, uh, it should still be able to make uh, the omelet. And this is something that, you know, humans are capable of. This is why I can go into a new home and, and do all sorts of useful things. Uh, and if we want robots to be able to do the same, they need to have this capability uh, to generalize. Um, but this is sort of in uh, stark contrast to a lot of the results in uh, robotic manipulation that we've seen uh, in recent years. And we've definitely seen some very impressive results with uh, things like online reinforcer learning and robotics. So uh, at the top here, we see an example of uh, OpenAI's dexterous hand, uh, you know, solving this Rubik's cube. And on the bottom, we have some uh, work from Google on grasping kind of arbitrary objects from, from a bin. Uh, and these methods basically train with online reinforcement learning where the agent interacts in the environment, gets some reward for the task, and kind of continuously learns to, to do this task. But part of the challenge is first that training the agent with online RL in this way takes kind of on the order of months of costly online interaction. So for example, in the uh, Google robot on the bottom, they have this giant arm farm of eight robots that are running for months and months. Uh, and even then, the learn policies are kind of tied to operating in this highly constrained environment with limited generalization, right? So if you, you couldn't take the same kind of grasping robot and put it into a home or, or uh, you know, even if you changed up the bin background, the policy would likely completely fail, right? So, you know, these results are not quite giving us the sort of generalization we want to get a, a general purpose robot. Uh, and so maybe for some inspiration, we can look at what's been successful uh, in recent years in NLP and Vision, uh, where we've seen these foundation models take off. Um, so models like BERT, uh, ImageNet pre-trained encoders, models like CLIP, uh, multimodal, which are multimodal. And basically, the kind of recipe that we're seeing here is that uh, scalable objective training objectives, so things like self-supervised learning or cheaply supervised learning with you know, things like uh, image text pairs, combined with really massive and diverse data sets, basically it produces models that are reusable for many uh, different downstream tasks, right? So in, in most of these foundation models in, in NLP and Vision, you have huge uh, corpus of text or these huge image or image and text data, data sets uh, and we train either like representations or generative models. And um, because they've seen so much data, you know, you can zero shot or few shot adapt them to a task they haven't seen before and they're very effective. Um, now, you know, the goal of my research at its core is how do we reproduce this recipe in robotics, specifically in the context of robotic manipulation, right? So how can we have uh, a, a robot learning agent that can consume a really large and diverse set of offline offline data, whether that come from robots or maybe that can be data from humans, and design algorithms that can sort of like a data sponge, consume all of this data and output a policy that can do many tasks in many environments. Now, there's a lot of problems to solve in this and in our research, we look at everything from how do we effectively collect 
robot data sets, to designing better offline RL algorithms, to how do you actually deploy these policies. But in today's talk, I'm going to focus on kind of a subset of the problem. And specifically, what I'm going to be talking about today is how we might use uh, data and supervision that exists on the web or can easily be sourced through the web as a way of supervising uh, our robots. And I'm going to talk about uh, three, three works. Uh, in the first one, I'm going to talk about how we could use crowdsourcing, um, specifically crowdsourced natural language, as a way of scalably learning reward functions. I'll then talk about how we can actually get these learned reward functions to generalize better to novel environments or novel tasks by training them on diverse uh, human video data. And finally, I'll talk about how we can kind of go beyond reward learning and actually pre-train visual representations on diverse human video data that then enables more efficient uh, robot learning. And so that's the, the sort of outline of the talk today. Uh, and I'll start by talking about using crowdsource language to learn rewards. So sort of to start things off here, I mean, why, why might we care about reward learning at all? Uh, I guess, you know, way we were just talking about uh, annotating and like hand engineering rewards, um, you know, and, and the challenges with that. Well, you know, at the end of the day, if we want an agent that's able to consume large and diverse data sets for across many tasks and environments, these data sets will likely contain, you know, data of varying quality, uh, but we want to consume all of it and output a sort of generalist agent. Well, one way, uh, one class of approaches that may be well suited to tackle this is offline reinforcement learning, right? So the, the paradigm in offline RL is that you might have a buffer of experience, uh, like state action, next state rewards, uh, that could have come from many different behavior policies, right? So these policies may have been experts, some of them may have been, you know, noisy or suboptimal experts, some of them may be just like purely autonomous exploration. And all of this buffer together, you want to basically fully offline, train a policy on this data, and then deploy it. Um, and so this sort of has the pros of being able to learn optimal policies from uh, suboptimal sort of offline data sets. Uh, but at the same time, you don't have the sort of costly interaction that's usually associated with online reinforcement learning. Uh, so, you know, we think that an offline RL as a field has sort of grown a lot in the, in the recent years because, you know, I think it's a way to basically uh, learn policies using RL that are very, very powerful, but don't require a lot of interaction and can leverage sort of all the data that exists. Um, one of the core challenges here, though, is where do these task specification or rewards come from, right? Like this reward is essentially the core of what the RL agent is going to learn and defining it correctly and, and getting these labels in a, in a effective, scalable way is really important. And actually going in and, you know, especially if you want to consider large data sets, going in and manually annotating a reward for all the different tasks for every, you know, interaction you might have can be kind of impractical or, or, or in incredibly costly. Uh, so in this first work, the question we asked was, what if all we actually need to get a good reward function is a natural language description of the data? Right. So what if just looking at a video of like, you know, this robot operating in a bin and it pushes the, the sta pink stapler forward, what if all we need is just a human to go in and just write in natural language and text, okay, pushing the pink stapler forward is what happened in this video. Is that enough that we could actually use this to learn good reward functions? And if we can, there's a lot of, you know, potential benefits. The first thing is that uh, compared to manual annotation, this is very easy for humans to write at scale, right? You can just crowdsource and then per video, they just type in kind of in natural language what they're seeing happen. You can flexibly represent the rewards for many different tasks, right? By conditioning on the language, you can, you know, get reward, a reward function for that sort of language instruction. And you can actually use this as we'll see to produce uh, language condition agents. So, you know, an agent you can tell a natural language the task you want it to do. Um, and, you know, given its raw observations, will execute control to complete that task. So in, the, in this first work, our approach was to learn uh, language condition, visual motor manipulation skills from uh, offline robot data and crowdsourced annotation. Um, and one of the kind of key differences to some of the prior work here is that this offline data is, can be highly suboptimal, right? So it can come from uh, autonomous exploration, or it will also uh, use like the replay buffer of a previously trained RL agent that has many successes and failures. Um, but basically this, this offline data is not an expert that 
can, can be uh, effectively uh, imitated. And then for our crowdsourced annotation, we're simply going to ask the humans to describe what task, if any, they see being completed in each of these episodes. So, yeah. What if, like, uh, it failed, like, in then how to... The human would write do nothing, or, like, the robot did nothing, for example. And so that's the language that would be associated with that, uh, that episode. So yeah, so there there may be there may be data uh, episodes in this data set where the yeah the robot failed or didn't do anything, and then the human can just write oh okay the robot just waved its arm around, and the model and the reward learning approach that I'll talk about can still consume all of that data. So I'll, I'll explain that actually uh, in a, in a minute. And is there any kind of like um, instruction for how human write this sentence, or it can be any free form like it can be free form. Yeah. I, so I I'll show you actually in a little bit. Uh, the interface we give to the humans, um, but and 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 our, for the like kind of real robot uh, annotation. The, I mean, there is some instructions, but it's they can really write it however they, however they want um, for the most part. So, but the key idea here, right, is because you know the actions in this data cannot necessarily be treated as optimal, um, and so we can't just you know imitate them as if they were an expert. Um, but what we do know is that going from the start to the end of an episode likely completes the instruction it was annotated with, right? This is basically just assuming that the annotators who wrote down what they're seeing in this video did so correctly. Um, and sort of the key idea of our approach is that we can use this assumption to learn a, a language condition reward function. And once you have this language condition reward function, you could use it for offline or you know, whatever your favorite offline RL algorithm is uh, to get a, a language condition policy. Can it be also used for like online RL? Or it, it could, yeah. You could also use the, the reward for online RL. Um, yeah, in this case, we mostly consider offline setting, but yeah, you, you could use it for online RL as well. So uh, just to kind of visualize a little bit more about what this looks like, so we'll have some offline data here. So here, each of the columns is like a different camera view. Um, but we'll have some offline data uh, that, you know, may be kind of suboptimal. We'll get our crowdsourced annotation. So in some cases, the, the human right, okay, the task was doing nothing because the robot didn't do anything. In other cases, the task was open the cabinet on the desk, uh, tried to in, tried insert the marker in the hole. So you get these sort of weird cases where like, you know, the robot in the video tried to insert the marker, but they failed. And so the human can write, try to insert the marker in the hole, but, you know, miss slightly. Um, and what we'll do is we'll use this to learn a language condition reward. So this is, this language, what, what is this language condition reward? It's basically gonna look at some behavior from the robot some language, and it's basically going to give you a score of how effectively uh, does this, does this behavior complete this uh, language instruction. Looks good. Yeah. Yes. Do they annotate the whole video sequence, or maybe just some frames, one sentence, another frame, another sentence? It's one. It's one. One sentence or like one annotation per video. Yeah. Maybe it's basically, what is the behavior happening in the video? Yeah. Uh, so once you're at this stage, like like I said, you can use. Uh, this reward for whatever RL you want, off, you know, pick your favorite offline or online RL algorithm. In this case, we're going to be doing offline RL and we're going to be using a model-based approach, particularly one called uh, visual MPC. Uh, so in this algorithm, what we do is we learn a visual dynamics model. So that takes an image, an action, predicts what the next image is going to be uh, condition on that condition on that action. And then we can simply, you know, combine the two with model predictive control to execute tasks. So I can give it an instruction, say move the stapler, that'll give me a reward function, and then I'll run planning uh, like CEM with this dynamics model to plan a sequence of actions to maximize that reward. And ideally, when I say move the stapler, then those actions will be will involve moving the stapler, opening the drawer, left drawer, right drawer, uh, et cetera. I think we have a question in the chat. Um, is crowd, oh, maybe I can pull it up here. Um, yeah. If one of you can read yeah, it. Yeah. Is crowdsourced annotations through preform annotations easier for humans than selecting a predefined label from a list? I think that's a good point. I think, I think those are probably of similar effort. Uh, the only downside of the latter approach is you need to actually know ahead of time like what all the tasks that might appear in the data set are, and if you're Considering a really large data set, you probably you probably haven't gone through all of it already to you know see what all the options are. So I think in that sense, natural language just writing in text is a little bit more flexible. But yeah, cool. Um, so that, this is sort of the high level overview. Next, I'll talk a little bit more about what does this reward function itself look like. So um, 
we call our approach language condition offline reward learning or Laurel. Uh, and it's actually quite simple. It's, it's really just a binary classifier of instruction completion. So it's going to condition on an initial observation, that's S0, uh, a future observation, ST, and then an instruction. And it's just going to predict does going from S0 to ST uh, successfully complete that instruction. Now, getting the positive examples to train this classifier are pretty straightforward, right? Because these we just take the you know, frames from the video and the corresponding annotation and assuming that the annotators were correct in their annotation, um, then, then these are, you know, fair to use as positives with label one. And then there's a number of ways you can generate negatives examples. So the most straightforward way is to actually just permute uh, the, the language and the videos, right? So you take a video for, uh, so like in this case, the, the language is open the cabinet on the desk, right? And we could see the robot is opening the cabinet on the desk. I can now keep that language, but take a different video where it was like opening the right drawer. Uh, and that's, this can be a negative example. Uh, we can also do things like if we know, like in our, this case we do, if we know that you know, doing the task in one direction temporally is not the same as doing the task in the other direction, we can reverse the episode. And that's another kind of more challenging negative example that you can use. And then the last thing is like, uh, in addition to kind of encoding these visual observations, we're also going to use pre-trained language models for encoding these sentences. And that's, as we'll see in a little bit, that's going to give us some improved generalization, even if we have like limited data that we're training the reward function on. So like this is like GPD-3? Kind of? Or it's like a BERT, BERT model. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just encoding the sentence. We're not generating text. The positive examples here, though, can have both successes and failures. It can be like the robot failed to put the marker in the cup. Yeah, exactly. How do you tease those pieces apart when you go to say later, like, put the marker in the cup? So it's because it's conditioned on the language. Really, what this reward function is just learning is, does some behavior satisfy some language? That language may not actually be the one you want to command to the robot later. So it should also learn, you know, when the instruction is doing nothing, that if the robot just kind of waved its arm around, okay, that's doing nothing. So really what it's understanding is like what behavior corresponds to what language. And then once you've understood that, you can specify, you know, the actual tasks you want, want it to do later. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Are you only using two state or you are just a it's just two states. I think it's a, yeah, we, we just consider kind of conditioning on the initial state because like mo most of these tasks will depend on some context. Um, in principle, one could also just encode, you know, a full sequence of frames as opposed to the initial and current state. Um, but, you know, we, this also, we found that this worked reasonable. I think that perform, like maybe conditioning on more frames would make it better, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. So is all the data from the same environment or like are different? In this paper, we were just considering, we were basically just training and evaluating on one environment. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that because it's kind of sort of a nice segue to the next work, but that is one of the limitations in, in this. Yeah, and I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. You said just for language, you used uh, NLP, uh, NLP BERT. Yeah. For vision and code, what you used? Uh, we didn't use any previous, so we just trained a CNN and end to end. Yeah, because. Um, there, at least at the time of doing this work, there weren't many good pre-trained representations for robotics in, in particular. Um, yeah. I think there was one question in the chat I saw pop up. What happens if there are multiple tasks in a scene and if you have annotations that individually cover only a subset of the tasks? Yeah, so that that's true. So if the data set as a whole, for example, never observes um, opening the cabinet, right? It's only doing other stuff. Then it's not going to give you a reasonable reward on opening the cabinet because it just hasn't seen any any data of that. So this is this is still sort of limited to the tasks and environments that are in the data that you train it on. Um, and that's yeah, and that's one of the the limitations that we kind of address in the in the second work. So I'll, I'll but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think the other part of that question was like, what if there's like multiple tasks? So what if the start and the end state shows the drawer opened and the marker moved? Mm. Um, yeah, well, I guess ideally in that case, what we would see is that when looking at the video, the human would say like opening the drawer and moving the marker, and that's a, a task in and of itself. Uh, but that's a good question. I mean, most in this work, we mostly looked at like, single sort of primitive tasks and not like longer horizon compositional tasks with, with a lot of different stages. Um, yeah. Would the reward be completely binary or like would you consider like a, 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 a mission might be partly achieved or so you have a... 
Continuous. So we, we use the we use the yeah. continuous, I mean uh softmax score from, yeah. from zero to one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Cool. And, and so this is basically how you train the reward. And then just uh, you know, and, and like I said, you can use whatever RL algorithm you want. Uh, just to give a little bit more info on the one we use, we use visual MPC. So the way this works is kind of given an initial state and different actions, this visual dynamics model might predict different future states. Uh, and then the Laurel reward is going to basically look at these states and say whatever the instruction is, like open the left drawer and score these different trajectories. And then you'll kind of iteratively plan in this way to find the actions that maximize the score, which ultimately step in the environment. So this is pretty standard model predictive control, but the model is in, in the visual space. Um, and then the score you're trying, the reward you're trying to maximize this learned full reward. But if you, you know, I think, um, a natural extension is to use the lower reward for a model-free offline RL technique, or there's a number of offline RL algorithms that, that one could use here. So yeah. probably I missed this, but uh, by doing model prediction, are you generating the images or are you accessing the robots and then recording the image? So during planning, we're only predicting future states. So that's why like you can see these things in the middle are kind of blurry because they're not actually real images. These are generated okay. future predictions. We'll plan using the model using the learn model and just the predictions and not step anything in the environment until we found like the best action sequence. And that's what we'll finally step in like when we execute the task. Does that answer the question? So when you say plan, you really mean like generate series of images with the robot movement? Yeah, so the, when, we're, when we're planning, we're not actually interacting in the environment. When we're planning, we're just sort of imagining future rollouts with the learn model and then selecting the best ones. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, curious. So, like, would you have any unrealistic movement in the learn model, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's not like, against the physics. Definitely. So, like, you can even see. I mean, from like that, that there's blurriness, and and I mean, I think this is one of the limitations too. Is that uh, when it comes to more precise manipulation, these sort of like visual MPC approaches tend to struggle a little bit because they can they can be blurry and then like predict things less precisely. Uh, so I think that is one area where uh, a model-free offline RL algorithm like uh, like CQL is one of the um, contrastive few learnings, like one of the, the more recent ones. Swapping that in as the offline RL algorithm would probably help with that. Yeah. So for this case, you, you know the action? Um, we know the action space. So we can, we sample in it. So we do basically sampling based planning. Um, like CM. So we sample many actions, predict many future states, rank them with the Laurel reward, fit to the best, fit the action distribution to the best one, resample until we can basically find the sequence of actions that maximizes the, the reward. One question. Yeah. During the offline training of the reward function, you're using real imagery from real video, but when you go to yeah. actually do the exploration, it's on like basically mm -hmm. like a generated output. Yes. Yeah. Does that cause problems or is that? That is generally a, a challenge. And I, so I think, um, we do some stuff like augmentation that, that helps with that when training the reward. Uh, and um, so, yeah, there are ways to mitigate it with augmentation. You can even also like feed the examples through the VA like, like you do in the model and then include that back in your training. So there are some tricks you can use to, to mitigate this issue. But if you don't do like augmentation, it, it, it is an issue. Yeah. yeah. If we, we can also train the dynamics model on some low dimensional state, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so another option is actually to like learn some embed low dimensional embedding space, train the reward and the model entirely in this like low dimensional embedding space. And that's very also another natural way to do it. So like in this latent space, like you get imagined to or any of these data into some embedding and you just learn in the embedding space. Yeah. Like yeah. you have some embedding to represent your state, you have some action, you use some network to predict the next embedding. Mm -hmm. But it's just that probably you don't have like this visual representation just to some. Value. Yeah, this does. I, I feel like this does give some nice interpretability because you can see how the reward actually ranks these different trajectories. But yeah, I mean, there's like there's a, definitely a lot of alternatives that one could use for offline RL, like either the latent space approaches, fully end-to-end -end model free approaches that don't actually use a dynamics model. Um, there's any number of kind of approaches that could be used there. Yeah. And also like for this visual dynamics model, like if you, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of other work also to improve the quality, right? Like, yeah, there's a whole field of like, how do we improve video prediction models? That's like, that people work on, yeah. And I, I mean, every year they get kind of get better and better, but. Um, Is this also true, like if you have a better visual dynamics model, like maybe this model, I mean, 
any of these model performance would be better. Oh, definitely, definitely. The, like, I would actually say probably when we get to the success rates here in a bit, I would say that the biggest limiting factor is the model and that maybe either like a model free offline RL algorithm or better uh, generative models will, will improve the success rate more. Yeah. But just, okay, so if there aren't any questions, then uh, I'll, more questions, I'll move on a little bit. So I'll just quickly kind of run through the experiments here. So the first thing we, we considered a simulated domain with procedurally generated language. So we just kind of have the robot autonomously explore here. And then we basically, using the state of the simulator, we generate annotations. Um, and this is just sort of where, where we want to compare our approach to other methods for language condition learning. Uh, and sort of the key takeaway here, uh, if you just look at sort of the average task performance, the first, I, I would say, key takeaway is that Laurel performs better than doing language condition imitation learning by over 25% in success rate, right? And so Laurel's the red bar here. Um, and the gray bar is like Oracle using like ground troop, everything. Um, and this makes sense, right? Because this data is like highly suboptimal. And so just this is sort of where showing that doing a sort of offline RL style approach can actually learn to improve over the behavior data versus just imitating it does not perform as well. And the second thing is if we look at the sort of greenish bars, this is if we use actually goal images instead of language. And we see that that performs much worse. Uh, and the kind of, and, and LPIPS is just like in a, using like distance in an embedding space for images. Um, and the point here is to sort of highlight that actually conditioning tasks on language is a pretty flexible and I would argue in many cases better way of specifying them than goal images because a goal image sort of over specifies the task in terms of like it doesn't just highlight the thing, you know, if you want to move the cup, it doesn't just show the cup, it shows everything in the scene. So that's that was our first experiment. And in the simulated environment, we also looked into generalization to unseen language. Um, so what we do is like in our in our default training set, we consider things like closing the drawer, turning the faucet left. And what we do is we go in and swap it with an unseen verb, noun, both, or we send out a little survey to the lab to like come up with creative ways of, of phrasing these instructions. So like instead of like turn the faucet left, it's like spin nozzle left. Uh, and basically we see that, you know, our method gets at most sort of 10% drop in performance, even though it's never been trained on these, um, but uh, which is great, but like as expected, this is basically boils entirely down to the pre-trained language model, right? Because that's what's going to give us the sort of generalization. If you don't use a pre-trained language model, this this drop in performance is much worse. And so uh, it's not too surprising, but but we observe that here, and this is also something that other work, other prior works have also observed. Cool. And then so lastly, kind of the maybe the main experiment here is we wanted to you know deploy this on a real robot, and so what we did is we took like three thousand episodes of data from a concurrent work that was doing online RL. Um, and so this replay buffer basically has like many successful and unsuccessful attempts of many different skills. Um, and then what we did is we just took this data set uh, without any modification, just you know, threw it on Mechanical Turk and, and had humans annotate uh, in, you know, with natural language, what they what they see happening. So this is sort of what the uh, what the annotation interface looks like. So we're basically saying, okay, given the video of the robot, write a sentence summarizing its behavior, um, and we just say like write it in the form of a command. Um, and so we give, give a few examples, uh, and then but pe but the people basically just have a text box in, into which they can just write whatever they see happening in the video. Yeah. Why do we need to specify the sentence like an instruction and not just the... The only reason for that is because we want to then at evaluation time specify commands to the robot and uh, and then have it complete those tasks. So for example, like if they were saying, you know, pushing the stapler instead of push the stapler, I mean, technically it's fine. It just means that when we want to say to the robot, push the stapler, it, you know, we would say like pushing the stapler. I mean, he maybe push the stapler would also work because we had the language model, but we didn't want to risk it. So we just said, all right, phrase it as a, <laughs> phrase it as a command. Are you constrained here? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have a, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, how does the quality of presentations uh, affect the performance? For example, someone could label an open draw as seen as new log as part of an adversarial attack. Um, so definitely, if if the humans are you know annotating things that's completely wrong, yeah, that'll, that'll cause some issues. Um, but you know, and the reward likely won't be good. But in terms of like 
phrasing and like people phrasing things in weird ways. I think it's pretty robust to that. So actually it's a perfect segue to the next slide. I have some like example annotations that we got through the crowdsourcing and we could see like, you know, the humans have do phrase things in kind of weird ways compared to what we might expect. So there's like, you know, rub the drawer handle. There's one where it's trying to insert a marker into a holder and it's like insert pin into the object. Um, so, you know, the, these, these are just some examples, but definitely humans have, uh, you know, interesting ways of phrasing things, but I think the language model, pre-trained language model helps us deal with this a lot. Um, and, but basically we deploy our method use on, on this data, and then we're able to do these tasks like open the left, we can command the robot to open the left drawer, uh, open the right drawer, um, move the stapler, reach to the markers, or uh, like reach to the reach to the cabinet. So these are just the five kind of target tasks we evaluated on, um, with you know overall uh, average success rate of sixty six percent over over these tasks. Uh, and then lastly, kind of like we did in simulation, we we have some robustness to the the complexity of the instruction itself, right? So instead of saying like open the left drawer, we can say like open the small black and white drawer on the left fully, or like instead of move the stapler, say push the small gray stapler around on top of the black desk. Now it's not that it's so the claim here, to be clear, it's not that it's really understanding like necessarily the difference between fully or not, but but the point is is that you can kind of there's some robustness to the way you would phrase this, right? So it's not like if you just say go from saying stapler to like small gray stapler that things things will will break. Since this is kind of a, the same environment all the time, it's almost like mm -hmm. you need to ignore superfluous things. Yeah, it's like the so the robustness here and like the generalization is on like phrasings of the instructions, but. Um, but not say to like new tasks or environments. And so, but yeah, just a, just a quick, some, kind of some of this first work, uh, the, I would say the key takeaway is that simple tools like crowdsource natural language can allow us to uh, supervise reward learning for robots in a pretty scalable way. Um, and then, you know, once you have these rewards, you can actually learn language condition control policies. And in a way, you know, if you use pre-trained language models, they can be pretty robust to things like uh, instruction phrasing. So what is the main limitation? This is actually something that quite a few questions have brought up, right? Which is that like, this is still very much tied to the tasks and environments which exist in our data, right? So we have this robot operating over this desk, opening drawers and cabinets. Those are the sorts of tasks which we, the reward will be good for because that's what's in the data. Uh, when really what we might like is to be able to, you know, take the robot to a kitchen or something and then have it, you know, put, put, put uh, things in a drawer, right? Um, and kind of thinking back to our original goals of, of generalist robots, we really want a reward function that can also generalize across tasks, objects, uh, and environments. And so in the second work, the question we were asking is if we can make these learned reward functions generalize better by training them on diverse human videos. Uh, so the kind of problem setting here is going to be that during training, we're going to have uh, some robot data from just one environment with just a few tasks. Uh, but we're also going to have all the sort of videos of humans that we can scrape off of the internet. Uh, in this case, it's like a, a human video data set called the something something data set. Um, and we're going to kind of jointly learn a reward function on these uh, on these data sets. And then the goal is then at test time, we can go into like an unseen environment or and an unseen task, uh, give some form of task specification. So in this work, it's it's going to be in the form of like a human video as opposed to language, but give some form of task specification and get a good reward function that works, even though the reward function has never been trained on data from that environment or for that task necessarily, right? And the the kind of core idea here is that the diversity that exists in these human videos should allow should basically uh, enable this reward to generalize better because it sees more tasks, it sees more environments. And so the key idea for the way we learn this model is again, pretty simple. It's basically gonna be a discriminator that looks at two input videos and outputs whether they're doing the same task or not. So this is uh, what we call like domain agnostic video discriminator or DVD. So we have the labels of like what is happening in these videos. And so we can say, okay, like on the left here, okay, both of these videos are closing something. So we know they're doing the same task. So that's label one. In the middle, we have like moving something away. It's not the same as closing something. So this is gonna be label zero. We're gonna train a classifier again this, in, in this way. Uh, and essentially what this is going to be doing is it's gonna be looking at two videos and saying functionally, are these doing the same task or not? And ideally, because we've trained on this much diverse data, it should be agnostic to the sort of like visuals and other spurious features and just actually like capture functionally what's happening. And this is just, and in this case, we consider the full mm -hmm. video. Um, sorry, uh, there's a question. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. How 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 is the label generated? Like, like what if the label is the the like closing drawer and closing door? Are they yeah. gonna be? So in this work, yeah. So in this work, we do assume that like all these most of these human video data sets that exist do actually have language like language and class annotations with them. So for example, this has like the human video data set has class annotations, and then because the amount of robot data we're working with is pretty small, it's it's actually pretty straightforward to also get annotations for that. We write in that this does assume that supervision. Um, now the more general case would be if we just assume natural language for each of these and what we could potentially do is use like some sort of pre-trained language space as the way of determining like whether these two sentences are the same thing or not um but in the, in, the, in this case we we have the sort of like general class labels of like closing something moving something away um i see yeah, yeah. but this is sameness in action sameness in like an object affected by action sameness in both mm -hmm. i guess yeah well so it's so that's a good point in that like you will have humans closing something that's maybe not uh a drawer and then like you'll have the robot closing something like a drawer that is uh and that would be if they're both closing something that would be treated as the same so that so i think actually having the more fine grained language could actually help because it, you can kind of maybe get a more precise word function basically these class labels that are in this human video data set are still somewhat coarse um but i think like making them more fine grained would maybe make the world more precise as well yeah um, and then we just encode these. We have basically a, a big video encoder and we encode both videos and, and basically just train this, this classifier objective. Now to actually use DVD to perform tasks, it's gonna be, I'll, I'll go quickly through it because it's very similar to what I described with Laurel. So again, we use a sort of visual MPC approach, right? So we have a current state, we have some dynamics model and some actions and based on different actions, we'll have different sort of predicted future trajectories. Uh, we'll rank each of them using DVD. So DVD will take the human video that it's conditioned on, the robot's behavior, and basically score functionally how similar are they. And that's how we'll, again, plan and basically choose the best action sequence that will ultimately step in the environment. Um, does, does that make sense? The, so the planning is pretty similar to what I was describing with Laurel, just the reward is different. Here, though, you're specifying the goal in terms of the human. Piece. Yeah, so, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, so here the task or the task specification is not language here, but it's a human video. But the neat thing is the human video does not need to be in the environment that the robot's operating. So like we will actually condition on a video that looks like that video to get to basically tell the robot to close the drawer. Um, but the sort of the key question we wanted to look at here, kind of going back to how this relates to, to Laurel, is like our hope is that training on diverse human videos enables better generalization. Uh, and, you know, because like the limitation of Laurel was that the reward was tied to the tasks and environments that it saw in its training data of the robot. And so what we do here in this experiment is we have a few tasks. We have robot data from this initial training environment. That's the one all the way on the left. And we generate three unseen test environments, like where we change the colors, colors and viewpoint, colors, viewpoint and arrangement. And basically what we want to do, what we do is we evaluate the reward function on these uh, held out environments and see like how well it generalizes. Uh, and so sort of key takeaway here is that training with human vi and videos does improve environment generalization significantly. So what we have here is like on the left, we have the train environment. Uh, actually, so the, all the green bars here are training with only uh, robot data. And then the pink and, and red bars are training with a mix of robot and human video data from a differing number of tasks. Um, and, you know, because the robot only model has never actually seen a human video, it's kind of unfair to condition on a human video. So that's why we also have like the robot demo version of robot only. Um, but the thing we see is like, you know, as we look at the test environments, you see this huge drop in performance of the, uh, of the robot only model. And while there definitely is some performance degradation for the one train with human videos, uh, it's, it's, you know, the performance overall is much better. Um, and so the kind of key takeaway here is because we train this reward with these diverse human videos that have lots of environments in them, uh, that this reward then can be used zero shot in a new environment and perform much more effectively. Um, and so what does this actually look like? It's like we'll condition on videos like this, and then in these three, in the four environments, this will be the robot execution. Uh, we'll condition on a video like this, and then it'll kind of push the, the cup towards the, away from the camera. And then we'll condition on a video like this, and then it'll, you know, turn the faucet. Yeah. Uh, how do you find the most appropriate human video to be used in this DVD score? Yeah, so in our experiments here, we basically will randomly pull a video 
uh, from the like something something data set held out set that's what we'll condition on. Um, so I mean, definitely, you know, if if the goal is to just get this to work as effectively, you'll probably you know want to like you know design the human video uh, in the easiest way possible. But we also wanted to have a sort of fair head to end comparison between the different methods. So that's why we drew, drew them randomly. But I'm sure like you know the choice of how you choose this video probably also can like if you choose it well, it can make it easier. And if you choose it very poorly, it would likely make it yeah. From something to something 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 yeah yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's sort of confusing. That is the name. That is the name of the data set. The human video data set is something something. Um, cool. And then the, the next thing, uh, just quickly, is we also basically ask the same question, but not about environment generalization, but about ta ta task generalization, right? So we basically hold out from both the human videos and the robot data these like the the, the target tasks we, we evaluate on, and then basically just test on them now. So these tasks are unseen to the reward function. And uh, like as expected, we see basically, you know, the robot only generalizes very poorly, but we see when we train the reward function with both human videos and human videos with a lot of different tasks and uh, robot videos, the generalization to a held out task is also much better. And like the success rates improved by over 20%. So this sort of same thing, basically just showing not just environments, but also tasks. If you train with really diverse human videos with lots of tasks and environments, you get better generalization. Uh, and I'll just skim over this for now, but basically we found that the, the, the same uh, result holds on, on a real robot as well. Um, great. So the key takeaway here is that, uh, you know, DVD, you can learn multitask reward functions on a mix of robot and these sort of like in the wild human videos. Um, in the wild here just meaning that, you know, these are like, yeah, people interacting in the real world as opposed to like in the, in the human videos from a constrained lab environment. Um, and leveraging that this this diverse human video data in DVD allows it to generalize better to unseen environments and tasks. Now, uh, you know, these first two works I've talked about have been about reward learning. And in this last work, um, you know, the question we asked is, can we use human videos and go beyond reward learning? Can we actually pre-train visual features that uh, on these videos that can then be reused um, for more efficient downstream uh, robot learning? Right. So kind of consider you know, the standard robot learning pipeline. Suppose I want to have this uh, my Frank uh, robot here fold this towel for me. Um, you know, normally, I might need like, a pretty large amount of data if I want to actually learn this policy from images and then deploy it with image observations. Uh, so it's very data inefficient. And if I'm giving it demonstrations or something, then it's, it's actually a pretty high cost to me, the human. Um, alternatively, if we had some sort of reusable representation that you know gave us good visual features for manipulation, we could maybe just download this pre-trained representation, uh, collect just a small amount of data in the target environment, and train everything with this uh, pre-trained representation. Makes my life a lot easier. Uh, and indeed, this is sort of what we see when going back to the foundation models in NLP and vision. This is basically what what happens, right? We have these like big, like big language models, like BERT or uh, or pre-trained visual representations, and you know people tend to use like pre-trained image net representations and all their vision tasks, and it makes you know learning easier and more data efficient. So can we do that for robotics? Um, and in trying to achieve this goal, basically the two questions we need to answer is like, first of all, what is the right data that we should train on to get a, a general representation for robot manipulation? And second, what is the right objective that can really give us like good features for control? Um, maybe you've guessed it, but for what's the right data, you know, what we're going to go with here is this sort of diverse in the wild video data, which also happens to include uh, language annotations. Uh, so this is the Ego4D uh, data set. Uh, which just came out, I guess, last last year, um, and this has kind of humans all over the world. Uh, I think in like seventy different countries or something, doing all sorts of uh, you know uh, daily tasks. And and the reason we want to use this sort of data is because we want that this representation can't be tied to a specific task or environment. It has to be general, and for it to be general, it needs to be trained on a lot of data. Uh, and this data is like really large scale. What, uh, what's the fourth? Dimension here is that the language dimension or the let's yeah I think it is it's a I mean it's just like video time I don't think they have any uh, spatial information so I think forty they're just talking about language and like semantics um, but yeah uh, as for what's the right objective uh, so we have a few kind of hypotheses on what's important the first thing is uh, the representation should have some notion of like temporal dynamics right 
a robot's going to use this representation to sequentially interact in their environment and complete tasks. So it needs to have you know, some notion of like temporal distance between states. Um, we think it should capture language because you know, if you look at these images, they're really high dimensional. There's a lot going on. And language kind of informs what parts of the video are semantically relevant to the task you care about. And in that sense, it's a, it's a powerful signal. So we think the right objective should, should be informative of language. And lastly, because we want this representation to enable data efficient downstream learning, uh, it's important that it's kind of compact and sparse. And so these are sort of the three axes that we think the, the representation should contain. Um, and so kind of motivated by this, we, we proposed like R3M, reusable representations for robotic manipulation. And so we start with this Ego 40 video and language. And basically the, the, the objectives in our representational learning approach boils down to one, time contrastive learning. Uh, so this is basically saying states closer in time should be closer in embedding space, states farther in time should be farther in embedding space. We train with the language video alignment term. Basically it's just saying from the embedded uh, frames, I should be able to predict whether this video corresponds to like stirring the snacks or removing the battery. Um, kind of quite similar actually to like the Laurel style reward. Uh, and then lastly, we just train with like some L1 uh, sparsity regularization. And then what we, uh, yeah. What is the motivation for sparsity? Basically, we want um, downstream learning to be sort of data efficient. And I think one of the big challenges or one of the things that makes learning less data efficient is like a high dimensional observation. So the more compact and sparse the representation can be, ideally it should enable more data efficient learning. Um, and for example, like even if, like if you're doing things like imitation learning, you have higher dimensional observations, you're more likely to sort of drift off of the expert state distribution. Um, basically, we want it to be as like compact and as far as possible, right? I mean, that's the motivation for getting away from using like high dimensional uh, observations kind of in general, right? Yeah. There also can be some sort of information bottleneck here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, there could be. So um, there could be information bottleneck. We also, so in our case, we just use like L1 and L2, you know, uh, penalties, but, but yeah, but the goal is to then train the representation like this and we then are gonna use it to do uh, data efficient robot learning in these new environments and new tasks. And uh, one of the key things here is like none of these environments or tasks, right? The representation has never seen data from this. Actually, the representation has never seen data of a robot. Um, but we're able, because we train on this sort of diverse data, we're able to just reuse this representation for these new environments and tasks uh, out of the box. And just to give a little bit more detail on the training, this is sort of the data we have, right? So the, we have these videos uh, um, of like, you know, people interacting, doing various tasks, and they are accompanied with natural language, like wiping the window with a rag in the middle one, or, you know, stirring the snacks in the pan with a strainer within her left hand. So this is sort of language that accompanies uh, these videos. And then our training objective, uh, so first we have this like time contrastive component. So like given the, the, the top video, we'll basically pull like the green line basically just means pulling it together, the red lines mean pushing it apart. And so we're saying, okay, states closer in time should be uh, pulled together while the states farther in time or states from other videos should be kind of pushed, pushed apart. And then we also have this like sort of Laurel like language uh, alignment where we're basically saying, okay, uh, you know, the score for this top video when I say stirring the snack should be high because that correctly matches. But for this other video, that's what, you know, wiping the window with a rag, the score should be low. And this is basically just forcing the embedding to capture features that allow you to, you know, predict what language is happening. And then we have the, the sort of regularization like the L1, L2 uh, terms. So uh, with that sort of in our experiments, uh, the main things we want to look at was one, does this representation enable efficient imitation learning on unseen environments and tasks? Uh, what components of R3M are important? Uh, you know, how does performance vary between different viewpoints and demo data set sizes? And then lastly, and kind of maybe most importantly, does it enable data efficient learning in a real world environment? Um, so in, in our sort of uh, simulated evaluations, we consider like low data imitation learning from pixels. So like on the order of like 10, 20 demonstrations, uh, and we just fix the representation and then train an MLP policy on top of it. Uh, and we consider a pretty comprehensive evaluation suite. So we have like five different tasks from like the meta world simulated environments, five tasks from like the Franca kitchen simulated environments, then two from a droid, which is like a simulated in hand uh, manipulation uh, set of environments. And then also for each environment, we're going to consider three different viewpoints. Um, so the hope is that, you know, these evaluations should be pretty comprehensive and that you're like, we're considering a lot of value, a lot of environments, a lot of tasks per environment. 
and a lot of viewpoints and because we really want to know like is the representation general like can it be used for a lot of, of different uh, downstream tasks um, and so we, we evaluate it in these three environments and sort of the key takeaway is that you know first of all you, you doing the sort of like low data imitation learning with the pre-trained r3m representation we're able to get 58 percent success rate on these tasks despite never like the representation never seeing these environments or, or tasks before um, we also compared to a number of like existing visual representations that are, are pretty popular in vision, right? So like supervised ImageNet is kind of maybe the most common one that people use. There's also kind of more recent models like self-supervised models like MoCo is one. And then Clip is a model from OpenAI from two years ago that's like uses video or images and language. Yeah. Uh, am I correct that in comparison to Clip, uh, you, you have added to your visual representations a temporal one? That is, but that is probably the biggest change. That there's two two changes I would say is like the temporal aspect and uh, the data itself, right? So clip is just images from the web, whereas because we're trying to do you know interaction and manipulation, we use the videos of actually people interacting, and so I think that's sort of more relevant. Actually, like the data distribution itself is more relevant to interaction than like pictures of dogs and cats on the internet. For example, if you could have clip trained on the uh, yeah, if, you, if we could train clip on the same thing, then they would just be... The difference will be not so fast. Then the only difference would be the temporal aspect, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and then, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, you know, all of these methods, any pre-trained representation is better than learning from scratch. It kind of makes sense because we're in the low data regime. Uh, and then, you know, the improvement over learning from scratch is pretty significant, like over 20%. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip quickly have over... You, yeah. Have you tried like, to like, fine-tune? Like, or... So no, and so in all of these experiments, um, learning... So in all these experiments, at least for the pre-trained visual representations, we keep them fixed. Um, we also played a bit around with fine-tuning. Um, in general, though, like, like training... Like, so training from scratch is fine-tuning. Like, training from scratch is... is yeah, um, is, is training the encoder. Um, for all the other models, we, we briefly played around with fine tuning them. In general, we saw the trends were the same, but kind of the main thing we wanted to focus on is like, I think fine tuning also adds a lot of, um, you know, different, uh, I guess, knobs to tune, right? And like, depending on how you fine tune things, things can be very different. And there's like a whole literature on like, what is the right way to fine tune these big models? So to get this, so, so, so for most of our experiments to just get like a clear head to head, Comparison, we kept them fixed. But one could fine tune them, presumably they would get uh, a bit better. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you could like have a increased uh, success rate, maybe slightly higher. I would from from the few experiments I ran, basically all of them are slightly better, but the overall trend is the same. Yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll skip over like basically we just have some ablations that's so general, like all these different components are important to overall performance. We look at like you know, specifically different viewpoints and different demo data set sizes, and we see that the improvement from R3M is pretty consistent. Like, for example, with the demo data set sizes, as expected, right, as we increase the number of demonstrations, overall performance of all the methods increases, but we still see a pretty consistent improvement from R3M uh, kind of across these different uh, data set sizes. Uh, but so the last thing uh, is, you know, can R3M enable data efficient learning in real world environment? Um, so I actually took this Franca robot into my apartment for a while. Um, and basically, you know, so for each of these tasks, I just give a 20 demonstration. That's about like less than 10 minutes of uh, human supervision. And then using the pre-trained model, we're able to learn like these tasks, like you know, putting the lettuce in the pan, pushing the mug to the goal, um, closing the drawer, uh, putting the mask in the dresser, and then like unfolding the towel. And overall, we get a 56% success rate, which is more than double if we were to use clip as the as the uh, pre-trained representation. So here the demonstration is like, it's just to take some video yourself or? Uh, the demonstration is I, I tele-operate the robot. Tele yeah, I tele-operate it with the PlayStation control. In, in the case where you're doing just this limited amount of mm -hmm. uh, demonstration from scratch, you're still able to achieve like a 20% success rate? That was kind of surprising, I guess, that that works at all. You mean the, sorry, in simulate? In the earlier. Oh, okay, and um, yeah. let me just go back there. So the, the this, this right, actually maybe this is the more, uh, this one could actually be good to look at. So the very light bar here at the yeah. bottom, that's from scratch. So that, so yeah, this just means 
So in most of the comparisons, we have a fixed visual encoder that's like a ResNet, and then we have like a two-layer MLP after that we train. In Scratch, like the whole thing is trained just on the demos. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely by far the worst. Um, but um, you know, with like twenty-five demos, it can get up to like forty. Uh, you know, depending on the, it depends on the environment. But yeah. Coming to your question earlier, you mentioned the Avalanche study. Did you did you do the Avalanche study on how important the time contrastive? Part yeah. So actually, the time contrastive part. I mean, one of the challenges is if you don't have the time contrastive part, um, like the it basically doesn't work well at all. So like the time contrastive part is sort of the main core part that is like necessary. So most of the Avalanches we looked at, I think it would have been good to include that. But basically, the the time contrastive part, if you remove it, really hurts performance. Uh, if you like remove, like we do some augmentations and we do like, if you remove the augmentations or if you remove like the regularization, you get a, you know, uh, not a huge drop, but you get some drop in performance. And if you remove the language part, you get a especially significant drop in performance. So that's just a quick run through of the uh, ablations there. But yeah, so the, so, so the key takeaway here is that, you know, we hope that like R3M can be used sort of off the shelf. Uh, like a BERT model are, like these like pre-trained image models are for data efficient robot manipulation. And we're trying to set it up. Uh, so this was work done uh, in collaboration with folks at uh, Facebook uh, AI research. And um, and yeah, and so we've tried to set it up so it's very easy to use. Uh, just a few lines and, and you know, you can basically use this encoder in, in your experiments. Um, and yeah, so I think we're almost out of time here. So just to, to sum up, um, I think to, to achieve this sort of goal of generalist robots that can kind of operate in real world homes, I think we really need to scale up learning and learning from diverse offline data sets. Um, to enable this offline learning, we need reward functions and representations that are general and effective for many tasks and environments. And kind of the works I've talked about today, I think suggests that crowdsource language and videos of humans are, are pretty scalable sources of supervision uh, that we can get through the web that can supervise learning these uh, rewards and, and these representations. Um, as for what's next, uh, I think actually human videos and language can enable a lot more than just rewards and representations. And so some of the uh, things we're looking into now is can we actually learn dynamics models or even perform fully end-to-end -end offline RL from this sort of passive human video data? Uh, and the question then becomes is like, how do you get actions for human video data? Can you approximate it? Um, and so these are some of the, the problems we're looking at now. Uh, and as a sort of side note, one other question I find quite interesting is, you know, much like we've seen clip language representations are sort of grounded in, in, in images and in some ways are better than like pure text language representations. I wonder if video and interaction can actually give us better language models too, right? If closing the loop between foundation models that exist purely in the space of language towards those that exist in the space of language, video and interaction can actually kind of make all, all aspects better. Uh, and some of the results with clip uh, seem to suggest that, that that can be the case. Uh, and lastly, I think even if this, you know, we're, we're successful in like getting policies that we can train on large scale data with like offline learning, we likely will always need a little bit of fine tuning or adaptation at test time, right? Uh, and so how do we efficiently use interaction or like maybe a handful of interventions from a human or corrections to adapt these sort of like large pre-trained models? Um, and so those are some of the problems we've been thinking about. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, all my advisors and collaborators who were involved in, uh, in all the projects I talked about today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to, I think we're at 11, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, folks might have. I'd be familiar with the, the video data in the last work. How, <laughs> what, what kind of scale is that? Just so this is about the ego 4d data set is 3600 hours of video of from kind of across the world um and kind of when you parse these things into frames yeah like depending on the data set you're looking at the order of like 100 to 200,000 like short clips uh and like on the order of like maybe 15 million frames or so for the data yeah how far away do you think like this can be applied to the real world kind of case where you have this, uh, mm -hmm. you can command the robot to do things by just using 
the new language. language. Well, I think the natural language commanding part has made a lot of progress. So like in addition to the first work I talked about, there have been a few other papers now that are doing like some sort of like natural language condition robot manipulation with both with like reinforcement offline RL and imitation learning based techniques. I think the biggest bottleneck is still very much around the data. Like we don't have big enough robot data sets yet. And so that's why we've sort of gone to like human videos as a way of getting that generalization. But I think probably the future of what this would look like is we'll have large robot data sets and robots interacting in the real world. We'll have all the sort of videos of humans we could scrape up of, off of YouTube. And we'll probably have like an unlimited supply of like simulated data that's not perfect, but gives us something, some you know rough approximation of the world and basically pull all this data together and train large models on it. I think that's basically going to be the recipe that that will enable that sort of generalization. Um, and yeah, and I think we're, we're sort of working on the all the different aspects of that problem. So another ongoing work we have is, so like I took the robot into my home uh, for the experiments in that last paper. Um, and one of the ongoing works we have is we're wheeling the same robot around a bunch of different homes and collecting more and more data. Um, and so I think we've gradually over the years been trying to grow the scale and diversity of like these robot data sets. Uh, I mean, even one day, if we have massive enough robot data sets, we may not even need human videos because there's enough diversity in them. But I think there's still probably at least several years before we're we're at that point. Robot data game, you mean like uh, through teleoperation? Like yeah, so we can like you know wheel the robot in with a controller or some form of teleoperation, uh, and and it can also be autonomous collection too. Um, and so like. It was a lot, some of the prior works we've done on data collection have been around like autonomous collection, which is nice because you don't need a human there necessarily, right? You can just leave and let the robot run for days at a time. Uh, but there's sort of this trade off, like if it's autonomous, it's probably collecting lower quality data, but then you can like leave it running for longer. Human being there is costly, but then that also gives you high quality data. And so how do you kind of get the best of both the worlds? That's one of the, another research question we, we, we were looking into, yeah. Is uh, sorry, I don't remember if you mentioned this. Is uh, ego for uh, for the first person view? Yeah, it's egocentric. So it's using, I think, uh, gla like the glasses or something on the on the head that they're wearing that's recording. Yeah, so I'm like very curious. Do you think uh, whether ego like does egocentric affect like how easy or hard it is to manipulate something? Because I think like for example, computer vision things. Uh, first person videos has a lot of interesting information. Right? Yeah, I think it, I think it does. And actually, like in the video clips we train on, you do see like the head move and the and the the observation change. Um, I think it's the most natural because uh, even from just like a scalable data collection point of view, it's hard to like if you were to pick some external view to go with, what is the right one you should choose? And that in and of itself is a very hard problem. So I think actually just like going with an egocentric view is the most natural and like I think our you know like learning algorithms are able to handle that data like we can say we can learn from that data and then deploy in a robot so I, I do think like egocentric is 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 the way to go so like when the robot is actually processing information like is it also similar to egocentric no so there we have the, the camera is fixed for the robot but I think that's a great point I mean like for many, so for some research, we have like fixed third person views. We also have some projects where we do like wrist mounted views. Uh, if the robot was actually mobile, so like all this, everything I'm doing is like a fixed robot, but if the robot's mobile, then you'd also have an egocentric view that's like a lot more similar to like what humans do. So I think probably the robots of the future will also have, will be, will have mobile bases and will uh, have egocentric kind of uh, mount, you know, mounted cameras. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah question. Oh, yeah. I guess, I guess I was just wondering. So like, if you had similar scale of this ego 4D data set in actually collected from the robot where you have ac access to like its actuation, yep. it's, you know, all the kind of the internal state that's available, mm -hmm. how does that change your formulations? Like, would you be approaching this differently? I think, well, I think it makes it much easier. Like, so I, like, I would say the reason we use human videos right now is because we need robots that generalize, but we don't have the, the, the robot data to, to do that. If we did have the robot data, I actually don't think we would want to use human videos necessarily. I mean, like if we had that scale of human video data, but robots with their actions, I mean, we could just take all of that data, run like large scale imitation or offline or directly on that data. And like, we probably wouldn't need to bother with human videos. So I think that is the dream scenario, is that like one day we collect big enough robot data sets that we can do all of our learning on that and generalize. It's just, I think we're still a ways away from that. And so sort of it's like in the meantime, how do we generalize best? Well, I think human videos can kind of play that role. But yeah, that's a good question. Before like this is self-supervised learning, right? Like you can just have the robot 
long in like uh, mm -hmm. by itself and then just uh, cracking a lot of like you know this is the image and if you make do some actions then then you'll be mm -hmm. the next image and you can collect a lot of data i mean yeah you will need a lot of robot but i think but i feel like that data is pretty cheap i mean yeah. if you if you just want to learn the visual representation but of course like if you want to have like a language to mm -hmm. associate with that that might be a little bit challenging because mm -hmm. you might need to do the task successfully yeah well actually i think like if we had a robot data set of that scale getting language i think is probably the easy part it's like get teleporting the robot or taking it around collecting data that's what sort of is most costly and then just throwing that video onto uh mechanical turk to get some annotation i think is like relatively much uh much easier. So I think getting language annotations for robot data probably isn't too hard. And actually, yeah, like the, the whole R3M model that I talked about, we train on human videos, but uh, if we had big uh, robot data sets, you could literally train the exact same um, representation on the robot data, and it would probably be better. It's just that like we don't have the robot data at that scale right now. I think there was one question on the chat. Yeah. Yep. Does completion rate completely? Whether the basic human labor is determining whether a task is complete or not. Yeah, so in all simulated environments, task, I mean, completion is basically like the environment has some defined measure of task success that it can measure and will give you back a success rate. For real robot experiments, there has to be a human supervisor that says, like, did the method fail or, fail or succeed? And that will usually be me or like somebody who's running the robot will we'll basically just like note down, you know, did it succeed? Did it fail? Yeah. This percent, for example, sixty or seventy, is just by analyzing the output. Yeah, so I, or I'll be there as it's evaluating, and I'll say, okay, that was a failure. That was a failure. That was a failure. I thought it was a success. Yeah. My <laughs> third party. Yeah. Yeah. Just very curious. What do you think? Are these others? Do, do we have other uh, sources of cheap instructions other than? Um, or annotations other than um, this uh, language. Are there other cheap sources of annotation? Yes, because because, because for language, for language it's good. okay. Yes, right now we have a big bunch of I don't know image versus uh, language pairs. We have even the same for, for videos, but cannot be done other than language. Other than language. I mean, it depends on what sort of annotation we want. Like there are definitely other things that one could annotate, like one could annotate bounding boxes or masks of like different objects, I think. And like you could feasibly use that to like learn it's some sort of. It's not cheap. But it, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's more expensive to do that than just the natural language. So I, I feel like natural language is nice because I mean, it's the medium in which humans communicate. And so it's really, it's, I'd say it's the easiest one to scale in terms of like collecting a lot of supervision that way. Um, I, yeah, basically, my opinion is like you have purely self-supervised methods. That's like sort of the gold standard in that uh, it, it's purely self-supervised. All you need is like the images or the videos. And then in my mind, like the next best thing that's like slightly supervised and you get some supervision signal, but it's like still very cheap is language. I think like everything beyond that, like bounding boxes, masks, there it starts to get a lot more expensive to get those annotations. Cool. When you when should we apply self supervision? I mean, I think like you can. There's like especially for representation learning. There's a lot of uh, approaches, self supervised approaches that you could use that don't de depend on language. You could even do R3M without the language, and I we had an ablation on that, and it's actually still better than the comparisons, even if it doesn't use the language. Um, we. It also like the dynamics models, like those image action next image are also sort of self-supervised models that you can train. So there's a lot of things you could train with self-supervision. And actually before, earlier in my PhD, before working more with human videos and language, like most of my work was on like self-supervised learning of like dynamics models and, and things like that. So I, I agree, I mean, I think that's an also great, but full self-supervision also comes with challenges too. And it's like, if you can make your life easier by just collecting a little bit of language, it can help a lot, I think. Yeah. Cool. All right, so maybe I'll...